I am thrilled to be with you all. I love this place and this show. It's fantastic. And I go around here and everything I see, I think, God, that's a film. God, that's a movie. That is fantastic. So keep on doing what you're doing is my first cry to you all. But here we are, the intersection of food, of wellness, and health, and what an exciting area that is. There's a huge potential for new business. We've got to keep people out of hospital, we've got to keep them well, and agriculture and science can do that for us. We're going to have a very fast and furious session this morning. We're going to, uh, I'm going to be absolutely ruthless with everybody, I'm afraid, in keeping us to time and letting you have some questions. But what I'm going to do first is I'm going to start with uh, Ian Campbell, who's going to uh, give us a kind of overview. But let me introduce you to your cast, uh, first of all. And at the far end, it's Marianne Ellis. Marianne, why are you here? Um, so I'm a chemical engineer um, and I use engineering, particularly bioprocessing, to develop enabling technologies um, to enable cell solutions to both food questions, problems and um, health cancer problems. Okay, fantastic. Sandra Corwood. Yeah, I'm the director of research for Promo International, which is an agri-food consultancy, but we're also part of uh, Genus PLC, which is an animal genetics company, and I will try to cover the uh, agricultural and food industry aspects of this debate. Jonathan Sheffield. Uh, well, in a former life, I was a GI pathologist, so I'm really interested in the gut and what goes through the gut. Uh, but at the moment, uh, my big interest is how we make sure that we can deliver precision medicine trials fast, efficient, in order to get these new products that are being developed to patients. And finally, Matty Dirty. I'm the Chief Business Officer of the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult, and I'm going to talk about the role of cell and gene therapy in healthcare of the future. Okay, you're brand new. I am. So you've got a great vision. Lay out the future for us. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I want to start by posing some questions and some challenges that we face. We have got a growing population by 2050. The world's population is expected to be around about 9.7 billion people. We're expected to live longer. Life expectancy is increasing. One in three children and babies born in the UK today are expected to live to beyond 100 years of age. Quite startling. Healthcare spend is growing much faster than GDP for the majority of OECD companies, uh, countries. That means if we keep with the same healthcare practices today, it will become unsustainable very quickly. With more people, the growing population and longer lifetimes, food is going to become at a premium. So our farming industry is going to have to produce 60% more food by 2050. At Innovate UK, we cross these sectors by addressing four key areas, healthcare, food, agriculture, and also biosciences in general. In healthcare, we support companies that are making new and better medicines, that are creating technologies that are better for diagnosis of patients' diseases, and advanced therapies such as cell and gene therapies, where these can treat diseases that previously we were unable to treat or even to cure. We support businesses all the way across the UK, from the Highlands in Scotland all the way down to Southern England. There are hot spots of activity across cities, that's true, but we also support our rural agricultural economy, as you can see as detailed in the map here. We also support three catapults in the health and life sciences sector. The three catapults are cell and gene therapy, precision medicine, medicine discovery. In addition to that, we also have the National Biologics Manufacturing Centre based at the CPI in Darlington. Two of these catapults, Precision Medicine and Medicines Discovery, are relatively new and are just finding their feet and learning how to work with businesses. The cell and gene therapy is much more mature and it's actually bringing a manufacturing centre online in Stevenage in the middle of next year. This will enable biotechnology companies to take their products into clinical trials and ultimately into the market. On the agriculture side, we actually support three agri four agri-centres these are highlighted in red, two of which are headquartered in York. 
The agri centres co concentrate on areas such as big data analysis, uh, in uh, innovation and engineering, crop health and protection, and also more broadly looking at how to improve the efficiency of farming and innovations in livestock. The combination of all of these uh, is clear in terms of meeting the demands for the future. Our catapults and our agri-centres are great examples of collaboration. They work with companies and with research partners to drive the healthcare and life sciences sector. What does healthcare of the future look like? So I've already said we are going to have more patients because patient life expectancy is getting longer and the population is growing. So we have to move from treating diseases to curing them and to get from diagnostic at late stage when symptoms are presented into preventing the disease happening at all. These are clearly challenges that we have to meet. How are we going to do that? I think wireless technologies and biosensors and data management are going to be key. Within the hospitals of the future, wireless sensors are going to remotely, continuously monitor patients, providing instant feedback to clinicians as a patient's condition change. This will lead to rapid changes in therapy and hopefully shorten stays in hospital and therefore take the burden off of the healthcare system. In addition to that, wireless technology and sensors can also de be deployed in the home for the benefit of healthcare. Chronic conditions such as dementia can be continuously monitored and assessed for any changes in the patient's condition and then the response can be made quickly, although there's not the need for the clinician's time to be wasted using continuous appointments. So therefore we free up time in the system to allow a more efficient treatment for those patients while letting them enjoy the benefits of residing at home. Farming of the future is also going to have to change because of the increased need to produce more food. There is only a finite amount of land in which we can farm. And as we know from Manchester and Scotland, rain and water seems to be disproportionately spent throughout the UK, let alone throughout the world. So we've got to use our agriculture technologies much better. There's also an increasing demand as the global middle class population grows. We have a, a, an expectation for higher quality food, dairy produce and meat to be available to these families. So therefore, things are going to have to change and we're going to have to adopt new technologies. So robotics and autonomous systems guided by satellites are going to help farmers in every aspect from bringing in the harvest through milking cows and on to monitoring for pests and diseases. Sensors are going to continuously monitor livestock to ensure their welfare. And in addition, we're going to use artificial intelligence to help farmers make better use of the land. But as well as that, we have to produce food in a more sustainable manner. That is going to be the key. And therefore, going forward, it's going to be clear that farms are going to have to use the land more efficiently and more effectively. The food is going to have reduced salt, sugar and fat. It's going to retain its flavour because nobody wants to have poor tasting food. And it's also going to provide a sense of fulfilness. But this may actually help treat diet-related diseases such as type 2 diabetes, heart, can heart disease and some cancers. In addition, personalised diets aided by genetic analysis will allow people to avoid food that make them susceptible to specific diseases. Finally, factories of the future are going to process food much more efficiently and safely. The food is going to be monitored and tracked. Waste is going to be reduced and therefore help sustainability within the food industry. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Ian. So a, a good overview. Uh, there are too many of us. Uh, we need to prevent uh, illness. That's a major, major uh, theme of the future. Personalised and agriculture and health have got to deliver all of this. What part are you going to play? Okay, so... Um, cell and gene therapy catapult. I actually stood on this platform or at a different location three years ago and uh, just as we were starting up and said okay these are the things that we face and now looking back on those uh, issues that we highlighted there were quite a big list we thought it was things which were barriers to the development of the industry and the cell and gene therapy catapult was going to go out and change those things. What I'm really pleased to be able to report 
uh, three years on is actually we've made an enormous difference to those things. What we do? So I'll, I'll get the clicker right. Um, and I'm just going to pick out two or three of those changes just to give you an idea of, in, in a short period of time, what the Catapult has been able to do. In terms of the behavior of the industry point of view, we've worked with the industry to, to bring in a much greater degree of discipline in terms of the design concepts, target product profiles, the use of healthcare care economics, which have allowed companies to use the capital that they're putting into the development of drugs to make it much more efficient and bring those drugs to, to market much quicker. We've developed a relationship with the regulators that's moved them from being perceived as a, a barrier to the development of the industry to being perceived as enablers of the industry to the extent that even with getting into clinical trials, the time to get into clinical trials in our sector has moved from over a year down to about 60 days. Um, but also at the core of what we do and what we've done over the last three years is develop some technology platforms about more rapid, more efficient, much safer manufacturing that allows these fantastically innovative drugs to be brought to the marketplace. Those are manufacturing platforms and analytical platforms. So then the question comes from that, that platform, that foundation that we have, what will we do in the future? And these are the big themes that we think are going to be coming up over the next five to ten years from us. The regulatory system, whilst we've got this relationship with the regulators, if we want to move towards precision medicine, to, towards great understanding of the individual and the, their role in healthcare, then actually there need to be some changes in the way the drugs are developed and manufactured and we need to work with the regulators for that and they are keen to engage in that discussion. If, you, okay. if you're developing a product, you need to show the marketplace and we'll, I'll come on to some, some initiatives in a second. The manufacturing centre, we've got that developed and, and Ian's already talked about that. Intelligent manufacturing, we heard all about that yesterday, it's at the heart of what we do. In, in industry 4.0 and also bringing that relationship together with the academics to bring those products through to commercialization. Last point, really when you need to bring... Two, two words on this. Two words. What, <laughs> what you need to do is bring together Sorry. economics, clinical practice, the payers, the patient groups and the patient advocates into a place where you can really demonstrate the functionality of these products. Okay, so I'm sorry because there's a whole right. session in that alone. Okay, let's, let's go for you, Jonathan. So why am I involved in it? Well, I've been a, a pathologist working in the NHS for 35 years and we've been talking about the new NHS all the way along. But what's happening in medicine now is the development of stratification of disease far beyond the capacity that we've ever seen before. And in order to deliver that precision medicine to the patients, we have to make sure that the clinical trials that we design and develop are fully coordinated because we have to make sure that we've got the right diagnostic product linked to the right treatment, the right, diagno the, the right treatment um, drug or whatever that treatment is. The most important thing though is to understand that as you stratify disease, the patients that are available will be much more widely dispersed. So our current model of designing and delivering research has to change. And it's really about this. It's about the personalization of medicine. It's about how you engage patients across the whole of the healthcare economy in order that you can drill down and find the right patients for the right treatment. And when you take on these patients in these studies, they have to understand the reason why they might not be getting that product is not because we're, not, we, 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 we're exercising a postcode lottery, it's because we are absolutely targeting an appropriate treatment to them. If we look at what's happened so far with treatments such as infliximab in rheumatoid arthritis, a highly effective drug, but only in 70% of patients. Over the next few years, we'll be able to identify the 30% that will not have successful treatment from infliximab or the biosimilars that are being produced to replace it, and we'll find new products that target those patients. The key to that is the diagnostics and the key to making sure the diagnostic is right is linking that in the research in the precision type trials that we will do. The role of the catapult is to make absolutely certain that those links are made at the early start of the development of that research in order to take you through an accelerated journey to a product that can be delivered to patients, you and me, out there in the whole of the NHS. Thank you. Great stuff. Uh, so Sandra, 
tell us where you fitted into this, and particularly, presumably, because you there is a personalisation agenda for animals too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if I work for an animal genetics company, and if I can uh, just draw your attention to our vision, which should be coming up any minute uh, on the slide. It's pioneering animal genetic improvement to help nourish the world. And I just want to draw your attention to the world nourish. For us, it's not just about feeding the world. For us, it's as much as the quality of the food, as much as the quantity. So uh, recent uh, examples would have been, for instance, the um, lactose-free milk, for instance. Um, uh, in recent years, genomics have revolu revolutionized animal breeding, but for us in the short term, it's availability of data which will allow us to select for traits which we have not been yet previously be able to select for. So if we get more information from the personalized medicine, etc., it will ultimately enable us to produce food enriched in certain nutrients or maybe sort of a, a, a change uh, the balance. Um, when we're talking about animal genetics, we probably have to also talk about the responsible use in uh, gene editing. And as a company, we've been able to, to produce um, a, a pig which is uh, re resistant to a disease called uh, porcine respiratory and reproductive syndrome. And the area of disease resistance in animals is very important as well because as we're using less medicine or less pesticides or less insecticides, that can have an impact on, on human health as well. <coughs> So um, coming uh, to the um, other part of uh, my uh, job, which is the uh, agri-food consultancy. Um, so sort of in the last year, we have uh, worked in 43 countries in the world, helping uh, companies to bring products to the markets. And health benefits have played a significant role in every single one of them across the world. So there are four trends in the food industry at the moment. One is convenience food, one is the uh, uh, food service sector, there's premium taste and there's health food. And the health food is not only um, sort of defined to the developed world like Europe or America, in places like Asia it's a very much growing market and very much wanted by the market. And also in the uh, convenience and uh, food service sector there uh, is a lot of investment going in into taking things like fats, sugars, salts, out of food. So maybe in the short term in the food industry we can probably make bigger strides um, than in the agriculture genetics but for the food industry is defined by the supply chains. So we have to work together and we're looking forward to the challenge but there's one thing in our favour and that is that the consumer actually wants healthier foods in the future. Thank you. At least that's what we tell the nice ladies with the clipboards. <laughs> let's, let's come to you now Marianne. Okay, so I said I'm, I'm a chemical engineer and um, I'm from the University of Bath where we have um, a, a large focus on sustainability but actually I'm here really representing engineering um, and particularly engineering in the UK with focus on tissue engineering. So two examples of where as engineers we can, we can kind of help everything we, we've heard today. Um, so take for example um, cancer treatment. So in oncology there's um, at stage one, sorry, phase one clinical trials there's only a 5.1% likelihood of approval um, of those treatments. It's very costly, it means, it means um, treatments aren't getting through to the patients. Um, organoids are a three-dimensional tool for preclinical trials. They've been shown scientifically to be, to be far better than the 2D models currently used, but there's a bottleneck to their use. And that's where the engineering comes in, um, is to grow organoids to enable their use by big pharma who recognise their value, so we can actually discover better treatments, genuine treatments for, um, for cancer. So, um, very wide ranging in, in what we're doing engin in engineering, and this is a new area Many of you might not have heard of it. Okay, cellular agriculture. You might have heard of cultured meat. Uh, Mark Post launched his burger in London a few years ago. This is a growing discipline internationally, and I think the UK has um, huge scope for addressing the engineering problems particularly, but actually we need a lot of people involved. Cellular agriculture is a collection of technologies that produce um, consumables, um, it could be anything from food to leather, um, that you would normally get from animals but growing them either using tissue engineering or fermentation. Um, this is not, my view is this is not to replace agriculture, it's an important part of the UK's economy um, and social standing but it can help to address these problems within in food. Again the challenge is growing up for cultured meat 
um, for example, enough muscle cells to make this a cost-effective solution. But if we can do it, and I think we can, we can see much more food produced using much less land and with a, lo a much um, lower environmental um, impact. So that's the engineering aspects. Fantastic. I just want to ask, uh, I don't know who wants to reply on this, but this idea of personalised foods and doing genomic testing of people, then finding out what works best uh, for their uh, genome, how far do you think we're going to go with that? Let's go for you. Uh, so I think we're going to go a long way, but behind this we've got a, a massive education uh, task ahead of us. We have to make sure that the public understand why we're doing this and what we're doing it for. When we do explain to them the reasons why we're doing precision medicine research, patients really accept that and really want to get involved. And I think for food, we just have to extend that beyond patients to the whole public. And actually, there is a, a big issue of public acceptance of some of these uh, technologies. I mean, possibly the use of some of these you know, cellular foods yeah. has been held back because of the yuck factor perceived by the public. Um, it's, it's certainly the first reaction is, is often yuck. Um, there's, there's studies that show there's quite an age-related <laughs> response. You speak to kids and they're like, yeah, we're going to eat it. They're completely happy with it. They're the kids that don't even eat broccoli. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's, um, and it is about getting out there early and talking to all publics um, about it. In cellular agriculture, um, largely in the Netherlands, but elsewhere, there's been a lot of um, uh, person working together between social scientists and natural scientists to enable that conversation because it will be key. Um, Sandra, what about that GM aspect? Because we, we're going to be a, soon an, a, a GM island alone, uh, and, you know, adrift from the rest of Europe. I, I think it, it's always sort of it's a natural reaction for people sort of to be a bit wary about sort of new technologies, etc. They don't know what it's about. But I think sort of for us, it's it's education, but also show uh, the benefits of the uh, technology, what it can do, sort of what it can do for health, what it can do for the well-being. And uh, don't forget, GM is only sort of one part of the uh, sort of what enables us to breed. We still use sort of a lot of the traditional methods. It will just help us in some areas and aspects to be quicker and more precise. So we will be able sort of to produce healthier food without GM, but with uh, GM, with gene editing, we will be a bit quicker and a bit more precise. And Jonathan, where does the microbiome fit in all of this? I mean, GI man, you know, microbiome is, is your thing. So, yes, yeah, so um, absolutely. And what's really interesting, the sort of information that's now coming out from things like the Phenomic Centre in, in, in London, looking at the, 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 the microbiome within our guts and what effect that has. And if you look at different diets, the effects on that microbiome are absolutely incredible. So there's a lot of evidence coming out now that what we eat determines what gut we've got in our bacteria and what gut and what back gut bacteria we've got and how they interact with our epithelial cells lining the mucosa of our, our bowel actually affects what sorts of conditions that we're going to get. So clearly cancer, the type of diet we have, but it's also that interaction with bugs in there that makes a difference. We need to start understanding that. That is one of the areas where we can work very closely with medicine, agriculture, and the, the engineers that are interested in developing these new foodstuffs. But here's the problem, Matthew, that we'll have an N of one. You know, if we have personalised medicine, we each have our own unique uh, microbiome, our own exposome and any other lot of ohms you like to think of. So how are we going to go ahead with regulation and with trials in that kind of state? Now, clearly, we're not going to get there tomorrow, but, but there has to be some vision in terms of what's going forward. So the, the existing system is really much, very much built around batches of trial work for groups of patients and, and the work that the... Uh, precision medicine catapult does moves towards smaller and smaller groups more precision and eventually you get to individuals but why wouldn't you apply that concept of individuals to everything in terms of health care and diet and all of those things but then you need to change the regulatory system the understanding the way we use data so that it accommodates that but in a world where there is lots of data you can move towards that. So Ian, is working with regulators a big part of what Innovate UK does in order to ensure that what you develop today can get into the market as quickly as possible? I think not only within Innovate UK but also within each of the catapults, clearly they, they are creating the sectors and driving the, the sectors forward. So for 
medicines discovery for precision medicine and for cell and gene therapy, each of those are in discussions with the regulators. And in fact, Matthew has a great example of how he's worked with the regulators to shorten the timeline down to 60 days for approval of the clinical trials. That's an impact directly through funding from Innovate UK. Fantastic. Questions from, questions from you? You're stunned. It's too early in the morning. So I'm going to ask a question of my own, which is, oh, we, oh, is, is there one, one there? Sir, somebody's going to run to you with a microphone, but I think you should just get up and shout. I'm sure you can do that. Adrian Bryan, Futures. No, you're going to have to shout louder than that, Adrian. <laughs> Adrian Brown, M Health Futures. I agree with a lot of the stuff that you've said around innovation but I think the bit that's missing is actually innovating in the health service in terms of the business models in terms of how we currently manage capacity around chronic diseases which as you sort of noted are getting um, affecting more and more, and more people and I think some of this very sort of far-edged um, work around genomics and so on is all well and good but there's a whole million of people who have chronic diseases today who need better sort of management now. I don't think we're ignoring those people at all, but I think that we have all recognised that unless we really talk, not just talk the talk on prevention, but actually do it, and do it through some of the technologies that we've got here, we are going to be in a right old state. So, so I think, I, I take your point, but you're absolutely right, but we, you know, the MRC's already had its stratified medicines uh, program around diabetes. Now that is a chronic disease that is a huge issue. And at the moment, if you look at the NICE guidelines for how we treat diabetes, type two diabetes, there's two types of people that get maturity onset diabetes. There are fat people, obese people, and there are thin people. Our treatment protocols at the moment are exactly the same, and we don't know whether or not that's right. The work the MRC has done at stratification of that chronic disease demonstrates that there is a difference. So that's part of the journey of precision medicine. We will then be able to think about how we manage those patients in the community by using different protocols for actually common drugs that we're still using. So we do have the greatest, latest technologies for diabetes, for um, insulin type 1 dependent diabetes, but we also now are seeing that there are other mechanisms uh, out there in type 2 diabetes. So I absolutely think precision medicine is not about this high-end cancer genetics. It's actually about real medicine. It's about how we get down to individual patients and what's right for them. And I've just made a programme, still available on iPlayer, <laughs> uh, in which I talked to a lot of people who just threw away their insulin uh, uh, injections because they were able to go back to sulfonylide uh, tablets, cheap as chips, and yeah. they do far better on them. Absolutely. You were going to come on back to me on that. Could I come back? Yes. Yeah. So, so uh, in terms of the practicality, bringing it back to the now, the advanced therapy treatment centres that I was talking about before, they're very much about that. They're about taking all of these things that are happening separately within the healthcare systems and the development and the catapults and bringing them together so that you start to demonstrate that these things work in patients. And with, with cell and gene therapies, there's a chance of curing, in inverted commas, you know, making substantial changes to the pathways of chronic diseases. And that really does bring a change to the system. And you've got to bring that into the system so that the system can accommodate that as well. Which so is what we're, we're definitely to do. not saying it's not both yeah. and, mm -hmm. but we really, really need to get out there and do some prevention work. So another question. Sir, jump up and shout because you're right in the middle. Yeah. My name's Dan, I'm from the Electronics. We decide how many medical devices. He's a medical device manufacturer. Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, right, so uh, from the medical device point of view, question to Ian. You mentioned uh, in future uh, in hospitals we'll have uh, connected sensors so that uh, clinicians we can have data and analyse everything in real time. Uh, my question is about the regulation side because there are medical device designers that can device, design the uh, device, get data. Uh, but to get the data from where it's being produced to where it needs to be used uh, is a massive uh, challenge. And the regulation side, they're making the regulations uh, much more difficult. Um, so kind of uh, both uh, moving the, uh, the different directions. Uh, the regulation side, they wanted uh, more data, uh, more uh, risk management side of it. And then on the NHS and the people who want to use it, uh, they want to embrace technology. So I can see 
Okay, uh, these two okay, we've got, the, we've got the drift of this question. So, Ian, what are we going to do about that? So, I don't think that the, the change in the healthcare system is just in how doctors interact with patients. I think it's how we are able to use the data. And I think there will be informatics uh, an explosion in, in, in with regards to digital health. And in fact, we're very much looking forward to seeing if we can impact on that through funding digital health uh, initiatives through our competitions to enable that transfer of data without okay, it breaching security. But he's security. asking you about regulation. The, the, the regulations will have to change. But, but I think if we look at the healthcare system in general, all the regulations that are in place just, just now will have to change to accommodate new technologies because the way that we're treating patients just now is financially unsustainable. Okay, Matthew. So the regulations need to change, but, but patients need to be kept safe as well. So it needs to be a, a, a staged process. But one of the consistent concepts through, the, through whatever you change to is that the regulators will make decisions and allow things to move on the basis of sound information and data. And we've seen that in our, in our interactions with them. We take things to them that are well supported by information and they will do some surprisingly accommodating things. So the regulators are not a barrier. What needs to happen is a discussion about what this new environment needs to look like in the future. And every, we all need to work on that and they need to engage. A quick plug for the Caspolts. One of the advantages of the Caspolts in this is that we are a neutral party in that discussion. So we hear from the industry about what they want to see happen, and the regulators engage with us and say, we really want to know about what the future should look like and how we do that. And I think we'll get to that environment where you really can move things forwards. So we've, we've already had Quickly. discussions with the uh, Health Research Authority because we need to shift the focus of research regulation from sites and institutions to patients because patients can control what data is transferred with the new technologies that are available and we need to get the regulators to understand that and we need to get patients to be our champion to say that. We've talked a, a lot about patients, uh, what about animals? Where are we going uh, with animals? What can we do for animals themselves? So uh, maybe coming back sort of to, to, to diet and variable devices, sort of, um, I don't know sort of that much about the human diet, but I know that in, in animals, sort of the diet is absolutely crucial in uh, sort of a performance, but also in the prevention of diseases. Sort of the right diet at the right time can prevent metabolic disorders after calving, et cetera, et cetera. And also, sort of a lot of cows nowadays wear transponders with, with wheat technology in, in them, which, which sees sort of how much they're moving, sort of how much they're chudding, etc., how much they're weighing when they're going to feeding stations, etc., so which is probably similar to what, what, what you want to do. And the, there is a marked improvement in how you can sort of look after your animals, uh, sort of almost before the farmer and the human eyes can see a disease sort of developing. You usually know a day or two before sort of the animal shows clinical signs of illness. So the proof of concept is already there in the mm. animal world. There is an awful lot that mm. we could do to actually prevent people developing uh, illness. Mm -hmm. uh, but to, to, to finish off, mm. um, are, they, are, they ever, are we ever going to take humans, wean them away from chocolates? <laughs> I don't think we are, but I think it's okay. It's about having um, a healthy, um, diverse diet Education is key. Um, a little bit of chocolate is okay, but ultimately we need you to. You heard it here. <laughs> <laughs> but we do need to, to education and working with patients and the public who aren't patients to understand what is nutritious, but also for it, there's responsibility for food producers and wholesalers to be selling nutritious food at an affordable price. So what I'm hearing here is about collaboration. It's about collaboration between different sectors. It's about collaboration with the public so that they understand what you're doing and they embrace it uh, rather than fight it and uh, resist it. And that they are the ones that pull it into practice. I think we rely too much on push. We should get a lot of pull from uh, patients and people for, who are advocates in uh, agriculture as well. And we must collaborate, certainly, with agriculture and how lucky we are to have Innovate UK to help. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you to our panellists.